for all the people out there with a dream that just wanna be seen. Yeah, my dream's bigger than the average. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Be Seen podcast. Today we have David Michael O'Neill, a gentleman who has directed and wrote screenplays at the highest level, a true creative. David, thank you ever so much for coming on the Beast Scene podcast today. I'm I'm absolutely honored. Yeah, no, I'm I'm honored you reached out. I I never know. Uh, uh, listen, I mean, we, we were talking earlier about this little cave I have. I I never know uh, who sees me, what's out there. <laughs> you yeah. know, I just uh, kind of hunker down and do my thing, you know, uh, alone. And uh, it's nice to have someone knocking on the door to chat about stuff. So thanks. Uh, thank you, David. Please share with us your journey. Please share with the world your history. Um, the game I'll try to do it. I'll try to do it briefly, you know, um, but there's so many kind of uh, different parts that happen in different ways. And then people that you meet at different times uh, that encourage you. And um, some are distracting, but most, most are uh, really, really encouraging because it's so hard. You know, this stuff isn't easy at all. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking a little bit earlier. I went to the University of Oregon up in Eugene to go play football, right? I, I loved uh, football. I was a quarterback up there for the Ducks. And when I took a, an acting class uh, for my major, I just fell in love with it. So Eugene is about um, 600 miles away from San Francisco. And I came back home for that year after, after school and, uh, I got a scholarship to uh, an acting scholarship to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And so I was, you know, commuting over there and doing my thing. And um, there was a, a chance to get in on an apartment down in LA with two other buddies who uh, were down there. And so I, 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 I sent them uh, $3,000, packed up everything I had and just drove straight there. And this was gonna be my new life. And so uh, that's kind of how I got to L.A. Um, I did before I went there, though, uh, what, what had happened, which might be interesting, is in, in college um, in, in this acting class, they had asked us um, who we wanted to be. What's what big star do you see yourself as? What big star do you model yourself after? And it was just a journal thing. Right. Part of a class exercise. And uh, what I wrote was I wanted to be Harrison Ford. I wanted to be Indiana Jones, like every other red blooded American, you know, everybody. What a cool guy. Oh, what? man. Wow. So what happened? Okay, so that, that's one thing to write it down. Uh, and I have it right over there, the note that I had written. And then when I was here in 1984 in the Bay Area, um, they were shooting Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, right? And so the call went out. They needed um, an Indiana Jones lookalike, a Harrison Ford photo double, because they were shooting... Uh, over just across the bay at Lucasfilm up on Skywalker Ranch. And there's a, a company called Kerner, the Kerner company. It's where George Lucas has everything. And uh, so, man, you know, I was pumped. I, I said, wait a minute. I wrote this down. I wrote this down. And it's like, I got to go get this thing. So I got together with, with a photographer friend of mine and I put together the, the Indiana Jones look and the hat and the, you know, and I went in there and I met um, his name is Robert Watts. He was one of the producers of the time on it. I met him and uh, I didn't think I got it. And then a month later they called me. Right. And they said, yeah, we need you over at Kerner uh, over the next few days or whatever it was. Right. Now, Jonathan, I thought I was, uh, I don't want to say just a stand in, but I thought I was going to be a stand in, you know, meaning they're, they're setting up the lights and you're there and, you know, the stars in the trailer. So he doesn't have to waste his precious valuable energy um, doing those kinds of things. Anyway, um, I'm sitting there and uh, I'm, I'll never forget his name, Ian Bryce. He said, we need to get you in wardrobe. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm just going to be standing in front of the lights. He goes, no, you're, you're a photo double. You're going to be in the movie as Indy, right? And I started shaking. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, uh, anyway, I was like all this stuff going on inside. I get in the wardrobe and I got a, you know, they gave me the whole thing, the hat, the whip, the, the, the coat, the, you know, the glasses, the pouch, everything. And uh, I thought, man, what, 
what dream did I just walk into right now? You know, and what? And I remember at that time thinking, I, I wrote this down. I mean, I literally wrote this down. And now I'm here. And I believe in that. We can talk about that later. But, you know, where, where you, you picture yourself um, with tangible things in the future, meaning a, a project or whatever. But anyway, so I was sitting there in big studio and then come through the doors was George Lucas, Steven Spielberg and John Williams, the composer. And I thought, man, and, and I, I started getting really nervous. And uh, the first the first scene what we were going to do was when the Mongolian pilots were in the fuselage of the plane and they, they were jumping out and yeah, Indy yeah. was sleeping and he's kind of waking up and uh, seeing what kind of trouble he was in. And he had that big raft and he kind of inflated it and, and jumped out. And that right. Kind of thing. Legendary. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, when you're at that stage, they don't talk to you on the set you're a, you're a, I was 24 just out of college they don't talk to you it's not like they're throwing their arms around hey Dave no so um we were walking across the stage to you know the they had the plane cut in half right so they could have the cameras and shoot and stuff and it was it was Steven Spielberg and myself walking over to the set and I said man this this doesn't get any better than this and 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 he's not speaking to me right I mean, we're there, but it's like I had to kind of take it upon myself to introduce myself. And I said, Mr. Spielberg, I'm David O'Neill. How are you? And uh, I didn't say, how are you? But, you know, I'm David O'Neill. And he put his arm around me and uh, he said, Indy for a day, huh? And I go, yeah. He goes, let's go shoot. I said, all right. So it was just stuff from behind fingers, you know, insert shot, stuff like that. Uh, but that was one of the moments where I thought I could do this. You know, I was interacting with Steven Spielberg and he was directing just little things, hands in and out, put, bring the hat down or whatever, whatever he wanted. And uh, that was my first feeling that uh, I wanted, I like I could, I could think about this business and then actually be in it. You know, I, I, it's almost like I thought about it so hard. I, I willed myself in it just by the thinking of it. You know, um, maybe that's all nonsense, but um, that's what I, it felt. Like. No, it's definitely yeah. not. I totally agree. You visualized it and you brought it into the world. You had, you had a, you had um, that goal, that vision in your mind, yeah. and you willed it into existence. I'm a big. I have the, I have the photo right over there. You want to see it? Please bring it over. All right. I'll... I'm coming, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm coming, man. All right, so I keep this uh, as a reminder because, you know, when you write and you're alone and project maybe not get done or anyway, I'll share uh, I'll share this in, uh, in pieces. So this is, I don't know if you can see that. That's like a Harrison Ford article. You can see, right? Wow. You can see that, right? Okay. And then uh, in this, I said, uh, today we talked about, uh, okay, a play, who we wanted to be. Um, I would love to see myself as a swashbuckling hero, as a Harrison Ford type, right? That's that. And then, wow, that's crazy. That's it's crazy. crazy. You know why it's right. crazy, David? Because Indiana Jones is one of my favorite ever films. I love that film. I still want to be Indiana Jones, you know? I want to be Indiana Jones. Who doesn't, right? <laughs> Who doesn't? I want Spielberg to say to me, you're Indy for a day. And I'll go, yes, I am, Steven Spielberg. Yes, I am, sir. Yes. Um, so That's incredible. from there, like right out of the gate um, from college is where where it's like I got a good step out. You know what I mean? It's like it, I got a good, I got a feeling of like, oh, okay. And then um, I went to uh, ACT in San Francisco and uh, moved to LA and began, began with uh, – commercials and I did a bunch of plays you know and in my theater classes are like you know Benicio Del Toro and Mark Ruffalo and Michael uh, Rich I mean these really kind of big time they're, they're, they're friends of mine I haven't seen them since then right or at the time but we we're all friends running around trying to make it all happen and uh, then you get an agent you get a manager you get uh, a part here a part there and uh, you get encouraged you know, and then, um, and a lot of discouragement too. I, I, you know, that very much goes hand in hand with, 
when you're you're trying to uh, achieve such a one in a million shot, you know, and um, I stayed at it. And then what happened was um, for me, I, I landed a film that Martin Sheen directed um, called Cadence. Cadence. You ever see that movie, Cadence? Yeah. Charlie was in it. Um, F. Murray Abraham, Lawrence Fishburne, and Martin. And I saw Martin write, act, and direct this thing. And we did it up in Kamloops, Canada. So we were all kind of together and uh, getting to know each other. And um, I, I watched Martin. He would set up a shot. Then he would get in the shot as an actor call action, do the scene and then call cut and get up and just do it again. Like it was nothing. And he was great. He was unbelievable. And these, um, these things were very impressionable upon me. Like that's what I want to do. You know, that's, what, that's kind of when I, I woke up and, 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 and saw it right in front of me, what I wanted to achieve or try to achieve. Right. I had a, a trajectory of sorts. And uh, when I came back from Canada after that one, uh, I was all hot to go, hot to trot with my friends. And uh, I got this book at Samuel French Bookstore called uh, Feature Filmmaking at Used Car Prices, right? <laughs> and I, I uh, put like $10,000 on these credit cards, not knowing how I was going to pay it back. And I, I just handed all this cash to my friend. And I said, we're going to make a movie is what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make a movie. He goes, how are we going to do it? I don't know. But I got this book. And, you know, everything's, all the information is out there, right? Of course it is. And so I, we did. And uh, wait, hold on. I got another picture for you. Wow. Right? So I, like I said, I didn't go to film. I have all the stuff all over because I have nowhere to put it. So I just put it in, in my little office here. But um, stay there. Um, the, the time I spent in school was at Oregon with a communications degree. It wasn't uh, at USC or UCLA with a film degree. Right. So I had to give myself an education. Right. And I knew that um, in, in L.A., it's a film and TV town. Theater's fine, but it's not like New York or other places. Right. So I said, oh, I better learn this, you know, otherwise uh, I'm going to be forever in theater in a town that's not New York. You know, if you know what I mean. I love New York. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Well, one of my roommates said, uh, you know, you better uh, you better start thinking about writing. It's like, I don't know how to write. This little short film was like 15 pages. That was nothing, right? It's like, what do you mean? Because I, I had planned to screen the film of the Directors Guild with another short film and invite people, invite everybody and, you know, do that thing. And, um, and I did. And I did that. In the meantime, I had a, a, a script ready. My roommate had given me the Jack London book, Martin Eden. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They made the movie a couple of years ago. And it's a, it's very about a character who wants to become a writer and he falls in love with this girl out of his class and uh, he's not successful. She kicks him to the curb and then a book sells and then another book and then another book and then she wants him back. It's, a, it's an incredible uh, novel of, uh, especially if you're a writer like you, self-determination and doing it, right? So um, I didn't know how to do it. It's like, but I had to do it. So um, I didn't have a computer or a typewriter or anything, but I had to, uh, I didn't even have a desk to write on at the time. I mean, I was broke city. You know, you're, you're a kid, right? You're, you have no money, no resources, nothing. And you gotta, you gotta really figure it out. So I just went down to Home Depot and I bought all this wood and I built a desk in my room. <laughs> you know, I had all the sawdust all over the place. And it's like, I started uh, writing Martin Eden. I would cut out pages and put them on the wall and and so I could see the movie. And then I literally had to get a loan for like three hundred dollars to have somebody type it. Right. And, uh, you know, you're living hand to mouth back in the day. And uh, I did. I had it typed and then and then I had it put in a format and um, I screened the film. And what happened was uh, there was a producer who was there and uh, his name was Eust Betzer. Do you know who Joost Betzer is, a Danish producer? He won the Academy Award for uh, Babette's Feast. It's a food movie, right? Back done in 86, I think, or something like that. And uh, he optioned Martin Eden. He, he, he optioned my first script. Paid me $5,000, and uh, I was off and running. 
you know, I was as happy as a clam. And then um, what happened was uh, Charlie from Cadence came on board Martin Eden. I got, you know, I got so much stuff around here, but I don't know where it is. But Charlie uh, came on board and then my photo was with Charlie on the front page of Variety. First time filmmaker gets closer to Eden, right? And it was like, I didn't know what that meant, but all of a sudden there was agents at my my door, like from UTA. And, uh, I see, you know, and it's like, I was with uh, William Morris as a commercial actor and I would do commercials for like Estee Lauder and I'd do commercial Sprite and Budweiser and, you know, whatever to, to make some money. And uh, I signed with William Morris after that. And then we got a letter and it's here somewhere. I'll, I'll find it. But um, from Marlon Brando, because he had seen the article. And it's like he was interested in playing Russ Brissenden, one of the characters. So it's like, I'm just like shaking my head, like, you know, and the producer was from Denmark. So he, he didn't know how to really navigate the Hollywood machinery, if you want to put it that way. Um, in Denmark, they fund the movies through the government and he could just snap his fingers and, at the time and uh, get, get his movies made, you know, but it's different in Hollywood. Anyway, it kind of rose and fell. And I thought, wow, I, I've had a, 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 a meteoric career from short film to Charlie and Marlon Brando to, you know, zip, nothing. And that happens all the time. It happens all the time. It's part of what you learn as a, being a writer or a director or trying to push your, your projects forward. You know, it happens every day, you know, so that uh, it can it can throw you a little bit, you know, because you think, oh, God, I'm done. I'm, all my grand grand effort uh, is now in the toilet, you know. And so you just for me, how I how I tried to overcome that. Betzer, he gave me, um, I think, five other five novels. Oh, sorry about that. Five novels to adapt. And so I went to Paris and uh, there was one called Last Lovers where uh the author was william morton he wrote uh midnight clear once upon a midnight clear uh dad birdie i don't know Th those these are older pieces but they're novels and uh he lived on the seine up in the houseboat on a houseboat up on the seine river and uh i went to paris and got an apartment and uh began writing all by myself just getting on the train going up there and working with him and hanging out i mean these are some really I, when I think about it and, and look back, some some powerful experiences I didn't even know that were happening at the time, you know, working with the world famous writers and yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And I was just a, you know, 28 year old kid um, doing it for five grand and finding a way to navigate through Paris and the subways and this and that and getting it done, you know, come back and here's a script for Betzer. But he gave me like four or five of them and I really cut my teeth on learning the craft, trying to learn the craft as best I could. What, what did you learn in Paris? So there's you before you go to Paris. I'm sure there's a you that comes back from Paris after cutting your teeth. What were the lessons you learned in developing scripts at that time, which changed how you viewed script writing? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, you know, working with William Morton, he, he's a novelist and screenplays are a different animal completely. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, trying to explain to him why something, you know, couldn't get in there. <laughs> you know, that was that was one thing that's that that was very interesting. That that one part. Um, being alone in a foreign country has its uh, interesting experiences, you know, like I've been, yeah. there. I've been there, David. It, it, I know exactly how you feel. You have to eat. You go to a shopping, you know, uh, grocery market. They start. I don't speak French. You're trying to get through the cash line. It's like it's brutal, you know. It's it's brutal. Um, but I was right near um Saint Sulpice and Saint Saint Germain de Pre. Had an apartment right there near uh, Luxembourg Park, and uh, I would just go running every morning, and I'd wake up and I'd write as much as I could. And I didn't speak to anybody for, for two or three weeks, you know, just nobody will speak to you in Paris. You know, they just, if you don't speak French, it's like, forget it. They're not going to really reach out. And, uh, 
that was an interesting experience being that isolated and that far away from home and, uh, and focusing in on the work. And it was like my senses got broadened. It was really trippy, you know? And then once I started speaking again, my friends had come over. I kind of got back to my normal self, but when you don't speak for a while, it's, it's another, it's like a sixth sense that kicks in and then it goes away as soon as you start yakking it up again. But it was, that was very interesting. I'm always refining my technique. It's taken me a long time to, to write simply, to simply write and effectively write simply, you know, um, you want to, you want to, you know, you want everybody to like your stuff and you're trying to impress everybody. And, and so you can, you, you, I can, at least I did default to kind of a, a longer narrative on the page than need be, you know, yeah, I had to learn that, um, you know, it's basically a blueprint and uh, a piece of architecture, you know, not a piece of narrative that goes on and on. Anyway, so that was my learning curve. And so I did Last Lovers. I wrote the English version for use of Babbitt's Feast, um, a project on Marilyn Monroe. And then uh, he optioned, excuse me, Martin Eden. And then from there, um, I got hired to write the Lady Godiva piece that we were talking about at Santa Monica Studios. Did that. And then um, after that, that was a two-year project. And then after that, and we traveled your way over to Coventry. And uh, that's a great story. I mean, that's a huge piece of history, you know, with William McCarker and Le uh, Leah Frick of Mercia and uh, Canute, Canute the Great and all the Vikings that you guys had to deal with over there, right? And uh, that was a blast. And then it naturally came to an end. And then I had to begin to look forward to what was next. And I had this couple of short films underneath my belt. And that's what I told myself I was going to do. I'm going to put together a little million dollar movie or a little $2 million movie or something where somebody would allow me to direct, you know, and uh, probably quite naively. I mean, that's, uh, I thought that it could happen. Um, but that's kind of where I learned what all the pieces that have to be in place for a movie to happen. It's tricky. You need this star. You need that star. You need this, you know, it's like, and then people drop out, people drop back in. Um, and uh, it was definitely one of those weird Hollywood moments because I had a, a partner named Dave Sherrill and Dave Sherrill wrote this, uh, wrote five aces with Nick Cassavetes. Right. And so we were kind of in that group, you know, with Charlie and Nick and Nick Cage and Carrie Always and Jim Gandolfini and just all these people. Uh, when you talk about Charlie, Charlie Sheen. Yeah. To you, yeah. 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 Charlie Sheen. Um, he and I were uh, were good friends for a while. Uh, I wrote um, I forgot about that. I wrote this thing called Threat for him, which was a book that he wanted to do um, as an actor. And we uh, <laughs> God, toured the world uh, on Terminal Velocity Press Junket. Love, love that film. That That is a film that goes well under the radar. Terminal yeah. Velocity. Yeah. Epic yeah. opening where he comes out. So of he was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't a part of it, but I was uh, traveling with Charlie and I was writing a uh, threat at the time, like wherever we would go. Uh, we went to, uh, we took off, uh, like Tokyo, Germany, I don't know, London ended up in Paris and we'd have separate rooms and I'd put the script up on the wall. And when he would be done um, with his press junkets, he'd come in and sit there and, we, and we'd just do it like I did in my apartment with the first script, you know, just it's all on the wall, you know, where you can see it. Just a question for you. Yeah. In terms of Charlie Sheen. Yeah. In his body of work, I'm a huge fan. What's your favorite film of his? It's a good question because you have uh, the early films, which I love, you know, Platoon, right? Um, if you get a chance to see Cadence, Cadence, the one that we did, not, yep. not that just that I was in it or did it. Um, it's just, a, you know, Charlie's never taken an acting class in his life. I, I you know, I, I, there's a scene in there in that movie where he gets tattoos on his hands. Right. And that's against the military rules and guidelines. You can't get them above your neck and on your exteriors. Right. So um, he gets thrown in the stockade and uh, there's a scene in there where 
he knows that he's getting these tattoos in spite of the U.S. military. And it's it's he gets on his knees and he is just uh, drunk because his father had passed. And it's just like, man, when I saw the dailies on that, I felt like I don't even know what I'm doing around this guy. I mean, I just felt like, wow, you know, and so he can often surprise you. Um, I think with his performances, because they're, they're under the radar a little bit. I thought he was, I thought he was good in our movie, five aces, you know, where he was getting married. It's a very simple story, but there's moments in there where you see why um, he was a star at the time. And it's just like, wow. I don't know if I answered your question. But- oh, you answered it beautifully. You answered it beautifully. We all have as films that we love or say actors who, whose work we love, we always have a bias and our bias is on the muscle memory of how it made us feel. Yeah, for sure. Moment. Now what I would rank, it's so difficult. It was kind of, it's unfair of me to ask which is his best because I don't think in art, which filmmaking is or writing or any art, you can choose one because how we feel today or how we feel in, you know, a little bit further ahead in the future or even in the past, Different times, different feelings, different perspective. And yeah. one and of that's the, the great thing about film because you could revisit them. Oh, it's it, right? it actually is immortality, it's immortal, it's legacy. Right. I'll be bold enough to say it. My favorite film of Charlie Sheen's is The Rookie with Clint Eastwood. That okay. is my favorite. Now, Clint Eastwood. As not only an actor, very sim- very similar with yourself, an acting career, um, writing, wow. directing. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in terms of the experiences, you know, yeah. like his experience acting, being on set, you know, this marker, that marker, this dialogue, improvising. It's a, You're actually in the world that a writer writes. You're there, you're in it. And then directing, you've been in the world, you've wrote the world and how it's going to be shot. You've, you've, as you said, you worked alongside Martin Sheen. You saw how he right. created, you know, what he was shooting. And, how and he- compartment- compartmentalized. And to- then like like uh, the, the setups, the directing, the placement of the actors, what he wanted, and then his placement inside of himself in the scene. And then calling cut and then just doing it all again. It was amazing. And uh, I was just like, that's what I want to do. You said that Charlie, Charlie Sheen, his dad, Martin Sheen, his brother, love his brother, Emilio Estevez. Mm -hmm. He is just, he's got that little mischievous look in his eyes. His cheek little little (laughs) small and laugh. He he is, he's just... um, he just lights up, he does. But so does Charlie Sheen. And what I find interesting is you said that he's never taken an acting lesson in his life, but his father's Martin Sheen. His father's in apocalypse now. His father's yeah. been through the height. Is it because his father would give him pointers that actually points him in the right direction? Or is it all just natural to understand what acting is? It's just insane. Yeah, it- it's a great question. I mean, uh, Martin is officially trained as an actor. So he trained, he was, he was uh, in New York and some playhouse somewhere, but I mean, he worked as a theater actor trained. Um, it's a, it's a great question because you're trying to put your finger on that intangible thing that they have, which is natural talent. And uh, I think Charlie felt confident to be himself and, and to be confident around movie sets and this and that um, as he had uh, his father being a mentor and he, he was able to watch him around those experiences. Most of us don't have that. And then we have to get to the set and then it's a new experience and no one's holding our hand, walking us through it, you know, and uh, it would be nice, you know, to have a little, you know, somebody shoulder shouldering you up a little bit and it's all going to be okay. It's, you know, but that often doesn't happen because you're moving so fast. Everybody's moving so quickly. And then the people you do talk to, 
are not the people you really want to talk. I mean, you can't, I mean, you know, they're, they're escorting you to the set. You know, you'd, you'd much rather be talking to the director, you know, and trying to get a calm vibe around, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you'll be okay. Here's your coffee. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I, I can't speak enough about Charlie's talent. I mean, we all know, um, you know, tiger blood and all the stuff and what's happened and, you, you know, how it kind of, um, I don't want to say went downhill. I think he's going to come back, but, um, you know, he's had his challenges and, uh, that, um, it's going to be interesting to see how he comes back and what he comes back with. And I hope he does because he's got a lot to offer. That's for sure. Me too. Me I too. haven't seen him in a long time. I mean, I don't see him. I mean, we have different worlds and, uh, I when, see Martin in church sometimes, but when you're speaking about mentors in terms of almost a shortcut and access without barriers, if my father's Martin Sheen, I am going to be introduced directly to Steven Spielberg and in a completely different way than just being Oliver on Stone. Screen. Yeah. Oliver Stone. You know, it's just going to be a completely different relationship where I believe that with um with someone who's new into the game, who's trying to build up a brand name who's trying to become yeah. recognized, who's trying to demonstrate their talents. I really believe there's a big shot at, you know, like a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's, and I, it makes sense. You know, you're looking a high, high level of business. You're looking high level of sport in any area. There's always going to be a club. There's always going to be a club. And what I mean yeah. in terms of the club is, is, you know, if, if let's say me and you went to college together. Yeah. Or you take Spielberg, Lucas, Scorsese. We all go to college together. We're all buddies. We're all making films. We're doing well. We're on a completely different playing field. Alongside that, our kids grow up together. We've got our club. We've got our family. And you kind of, you. what do we do with family? You know, this is our family and we do our thing. And to enter into that, like friendship circles, it's it's not as easy. But what- it's like uh it's like I was watching the um Prince Harry and what's her name? Uh, Meghan Markle. Mar- 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 yeah. Marple or Markle? Markle. Uh, Markle. She was talking about uh being the new person in the group in you know under the house of Windsor, you know. And uh somebody explained it to her like you, you become this organism in a system that's already very well oiled and healed, right? And it can become a threat to those people in this group. Like who's a new person? What does he or she want? What are their ambitions? You know, that kind of thing. Right. And so they're, they're, they're careful around you. Um, they, they're, they're, there's a, a length of time where a sense of trust has to happen. You know, uh, for me, I was just happy. Uh, the Sheens became, like Martin became like my second father, literally for like 13 years, almost or 14 years. Um, I saw him uh, very political, of course. And uh, I began to get politicized and um, he would um, get arrested and I would go watch because I was very interested in the connection between an actor's power on the screen and then what the actor's personal life looked like do they match? Is it, is it off? Is it, you know, that to me is curious. I'm curious about that kind of thing. And so when you're trying to develop as a young actor, right. You're, you're um, leaning towards characters or personalities or other actors that you um, are impressed with. And then you try to emulate that. And, uh, you know, I mean, to such a degree, I I went down to Nicaragua and lived with, (laughs) God, that was insane. The Contras and the Sandinistas, you know, through Witness for Peace for six weeks down in Honduras and Managua and all these places that are just at the tail end end of the Contra-Sandinista war. And I came back and I felt I was a little bit closer to Martin than, you know, or at least in being like uh, what I'd hoped to be of myself as a person, you know. So I would plunge myself into these experiences. Um, and I don't know why. I respect, that. I, respect What's that? That. I respect that massively. I respect that massively. Oh. I'll tell you why. Because listening to you, do you know the thing that keeps screaming out at me? You don't think you do. 
You don't spend time thinking about it and overthinking it. I think a lot of people in the world do that. That's why their progress is hindered. They don't move forward enough. Right. You just get up and go. You do it. You're a doer. I always think that I'm going to be uh, left behind if I don't. And not only that, that's where the fun is anyway. It's where the fun is. It's, I just, I always, listen, I just always wanted to do cool things. I didn't go to film school, but I, I've directed films. I didn't, uh, my piano's over there. I can play it. I never took a piano lesson in my life, guitar, same way, or real estate. You know, after five aces, man, that was tough. That was tough, Jonathan, because, uh, you know, you, you get paid right when you hit certain thresholds, like you turn in this cut, that cut, that kind of thing. And then they pulled my editor off and then they put him on other movies. Right. And so I'm, I'm getting stretched. You got bills, you got rent, you got taxes, you got attorney fees, you got agent fee, you know, just all this stuff. Right? And I lost my apartment in LA after 16, 17 years, because I got involved in, you know, I mean, I did the movie on one hand, first writing directing experience on one hand and then you're dealing with kind of <clears throat> people <laughs> i don't want to you know call them names or anything but i mean people who are um powerful and they want to you know keep the budget over here as much as humanly possible and stretch things and get as much as you can and you know guys like me who at that time anyway uh didn't have a producing partner i i just got eaten up just eaten up by um, you know, Charlie with a little bit of tiger blood all over the place, you know, and being a tough, tough person to work with at that time and producers who were just trying to get the movie done. And um, I lost my apartment. I came home and uh, to where I am now. And uh, I thought, man, how, how could all that happen? How, how could I finally get to a point where I'm writing and directing a feature film with stars major stars in it and then this other thing happened where i completely get evaporated of resources and i lose my apartment how, how does that go down right so it's it's incongruous in a way right so i went you know across the street where i live there's an olympic sized swimming pool and i thought well i'll go over and be a lifeguard <laughs> I swear, kind of, you know, for the for a little while or whatever. And um, so I tested out. Right. So and I was pissed, you know, and it's just like, how did I get here kind of thing? And uh, you have to take the test. So you have to swim for uh, 200 meters. You have to tread with your hands up this way. Right. For I've been a, I've been a lifeguard. OK, you know, then I have oh, a question no. for you. Go ahead. I have a question for you. All right. All right. So it's a fit, it's a big Olympic sized swimming pool over there, right? 15 feet deep. You know, they got a white rubber brick. They toss it in the, in the deep end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they got my they, I'm up to here in the water, and you have to go like this down feet first. That was the third part of the test. And, and push yourself up to get you to the bottom. It's crazy. You try that. Yeah, did it? Yeah, it it must be a universal um a universal structure to so how you pass to be a lifeguard. <laughs> I got about eight feet down and I thought, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing to push off in the middle. <laughs> and uh, it, it's hard to explain, but this, this, um, this uh, fight or flight thing kicked in, this fury kicked in. I mean, it was a fury I've never had before in my life. And I, so I, 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 I dove down, I found that brick and I, I tucked it in my back swim trunks and I pushed off the bottom and I literally had to save my life to get to the top. And I nearly drowned, nearly drowned. I mean, that was, that was no bullshit, man. You got a question? I can tell. You know what is really interesting? This is the time where you lose your apartment. This is the time where you've just made a feature film with mega stars. Yeah. Yeah. This is almost an analogy for you. Are you going to keep going? Are you going to give up? Because oh. that would be emotions. You must be feeling like, like two different sides of the spectrum. Elation yeah. in the film. The other side is how am I losing when I'm gaining? And just that moment of I'm going to keep going. And how do you how do you even metabolize all that? Yeah. So, like I can I can kind of feel it now by as I'm remembering it, right? And. Uh, I grabbed that brick and, and I, I was, um, 
and I, you know, I'm pretty easy going, you know, but when you're in that circumstance, um, I, I thought I went down to LA, I became an actor. I met all these people, I made a living. I got to a point where I wrote and directed my first feature film. It got out there. It's out there. Um, we won the uh, Fort Lauderdale International Film. I'm pumped. Then financially, I get stretched, right, by producers, people, whatever. Lose my apartment. I drive home. My car literally just went and stopped and never started again. <laughs> it's true. I swear to God, it's true. I go across the street and almost drown. I grabbed that white rubber brick and I threw it at the guy, right? And uh, I said, I'm out of here, man, after I passed all the tests, right? And what happened, I thought, and I was so depressed. I mean, I'm not kidding. I was at the bottom of life's barrel, man. And I thought, how, uh, you know, where else can I find the strength to start again? I had no idea, right? Where, where do you, you know? Luckily, my mom, she took me in. My dad, uh, he passed, so she was alone, came home, and just, I was, uh, I was low. And what happened, this is what happened. So I had a friend down in um, Las Vegas, and he said, Davey, he said, come on down, man. You're all beaten up. Come on down. We'll have some fun, right? And I said, well, all right. So I drive down there. It's about, it's about 10 hours from here. It's about 600 miles. And uh, we were out, one of the clubs. So we get back. And it's like six in the morning. It's like 105 degrees at six in the morning, right? In Las Vegas. And we're in the pool. He's in the pool, Swagger. He's got that white stuff on his nose. He's got a hat, cowboy hat, or one of those beach hats or something. He's smoking. I don't smoke, but he was smoking. He goes, you know, Davey, he goes, I'm making $110 a day in this house. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, it's going up $110 a day in equity out here. You should get out here. And I said, you're sitting in the pool and making money. You know, and, and coming from where I had just come from, I said, I don't know anything about real estate, but I'm going to go find out. And I took a shower, started driving around all the whole valley of Las Vegas and got probably every brochure of every housing development. Uh, I didn't even know how to fund a house, nothing. Uh, long story short, I partnered with my family and uh, banks were giving money away at the time, you know, back in the early days with... Um, adjustable rate mortgages and all that. They were just. When would this have been? What year? 90? 05, 06. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then the crash hit 07, I think, or whatever. Anyway, uh, Jonathan, I was so filled with, um, I would say, fury and optimism. Kind of another mix of things. Oh, no, that feels. And I, and I, and I said to myself, I'm never, if I can, if I can manage it, right. I'm never going to be at the bottom of the pool again, ever. And I went out and I bought 10 houses in two years. I closed the brand new house every two months. And it almost killed, it almost killed me, but it was from that energy of having a film, having getting there and then having, you know, it's like, a, it's like a Hemingway's uh, old man in the sea, right? You catch the big fish. By the time you get it to shore, it's all nibbled to the bone by everybody else. That was my lesson. And so I've gotten a little, I've gotten a little tougher. I still have the houses. They're performing. It's all good. You know, it's all good. And uh, the renting, they're all rented. I take care of my mom with them. You know, uh, my brother paid his house off. He's fine. My other sister, fine. Everybody's all, you know, because I partnered and, and created a team and got that team across the end zone as a team. And uh, so that's basically what I do. I write and then I run my real estate. And so, uh, you know, it was from that thing of not wanting to be defeated, but not knowing how to, uh, okay, like um, what game to play not to be defeated. If that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, it does. You yeah. think about your inspirations, Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford. Now that guy is a legend. I think about, you know, yeah. He was cool to me too, which... Uh, what was he like with you? He was like... Um, it's like I said, you know, it's like... Uh, they, they don't really talk to you, you know? I mean... But, you know, you're standing next to Harrison Ford and then some days you're doing the uh, stand in work. Other days you're doing the photo double work. Right. And after a while, he'd take his hat off and put it on me, you know, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Right. I mean, it's like. 
it was cool. It was, it, it got me out of the gate, you know, and, um, you know, and you never know what's going to happen. Like, like when I was in Las Vegas and setting up that stuff in Arizona, um, a, a film that I had written, uh, like 10, 10 years, seven, eight years earlier, player 5150. Do you see that one on the, I've looked uh, at all of your credits. Oh, you've looked at them. Huh? Oh, well, um, cool. we, we shot that one in Las Vegas. And so I was there with these homes. Now I'm shooting a movie in Las Vegas in one of these casinos, you know? So it's like, that was a very, very cool experience. And, uh, you just keep going, man. You just keep going and punching and you see how things develop. And I think you, you approach it with a, a good and open and earnest heart and not be shy about um, what you hope to endeavor. You know, I have a, um, a new script that I just finished called Saving MLK. And uh, it's one of my most ambitious ideas. And I got the idea from um, actually Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where Sharon Tate she wasn't killed. Right? Where in if your life she was. So you're changing the narrative of if this didn't happen, where would it have led? It's it's a subgenre almost, you know, same with um, Inglorious Bastards, you know, the Nazis got it. Same thing. So I, I, I found it interesting to explore the idea if Martin Luther King didn't, wasn't killed, you know? So it's taken me on this very, very interesting creative spin and it's captured the folks who have read stuff so far do you know what you're doing? You're using your imagination. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I felt what happened was, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of stuff that uh, led up to James Earl Ray and uh, Martin Luther King and, uh, you know, um, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. And it's like, wait a minute, I have a whole other story here. That's, that's, so it's like a corkscrew where all those events accelerate and how we get there. Yeah. But I'm really excited about that. And that's a new one. That's a new one I just wrote. And then, uh, but I've had some fun experiences, you know, where it's like I got a one job where they it took me to Ephesus, Turkey. Do you know what's in Ephesus, Turkey over there? It's it's where they think um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, ended up after the crucifixion. Oh, okay. And her house is there. And they asked me to write a white paper on it. And uh, I'm close um, friends with a gentleman named uh, Colm Estridge, who is Mel Gibson's uh, nephew. And he runs the church up there. There's a church up in uh, a Catholic church up in uh, Agora Hills. It's Mel's and it's old school, you know, for sure. It's uh, it's in Latin. I mean, the whole it's heavy. Right. But anyway, uh, Colm is a good buddy of mine. He gave me a book called The Mystical City of God, written by Mary of Greta. And um, she thinks I mean, the book is these volumes uh, where Mary, mother of Mary, spoke to Mary of Agreda and. And they're just like not of this world, you know. So I thought I'm going to try that. So meaning, I wrote a, I wrote a um, screenplay called the, uh, the Mystical City of God, based on Mary of Greta, her 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 visions, and what it may look like to Mary after the crucifixion. Nobody really thinks about it. She drops out of the Bible, but she's one of the most, probably the most famous female heroine in antiquity, bar none. Yeah. Okay. And it was just beautiful over there. Dependent on faith, dependent on faith. But even, even still, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Within the Quran is Miriam. You know, her name, regardless what name she embodies, she's still prevalent as the. It's great. You, it's very interesting. I was going to say, just add to that. It's great you said that because uh, at her house, right up there in Ephesus, it's in Izmir, Turkey, right? Uh, half the people who visit are Muslims, half are Christians. And it's like, this is cool. This yeah, is really cool. Um, yeah, so I have that one, and uh, we're, we're beginning to tinker with that one, too. So um, Something I wanted to ask you. Yeah. <clears throat> going back to yourself, writing screenplays, when we spoke about Paris, okay? To you today. Now, you can only share three points with a keen, aspiring screenwriter. Okay. To save them all those years of time and trials for what you went through, what mistakes would you, yeah, <laughs> what mistakes would you point out that you made not to make and actually the way to do it? Three tips sure. on, how to read, on how to write a professional screenplay to a standard that Hollywood goes, yes, please. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. And isn't that the, the elixir, right? Um, 
First thing I would, I would, I would uh, suggest, there's probably more than three. I mean, you have to have a work ethic. You have to be dogged. You have to, your personality has to, you know, be someone who's just not going to be shut down. You know, that's the first thing. There's a personality trait that I think is really important. Um, the, the other thing is, um, or many other things are read, read scripts that have been produced. That's your, that's your roadmap. Read scripts that have been produced. Okay. Um, find, here's a little trick. I, you know, it's like when I wrote the Jack London piece, um, I thought that uh, if I had my name under Jack London, they couldn't push me off, <laughs> you know? So I was associating with <laughs> Jack London. Uh, that was a piece of public domain. Find a great piece of public domain that you can convert into a script. It won't cost you anything other than your time. Right. That's that's one thing where you can have a great story. Make sure you, uh, you know, have somebody spell check your work. I'm the worst speller on the planet. I have to have somebody do it because I see it so much and I, I can't see it anymore after a while. That's one thing. Um, uh, not not so much one script, but think of the legacy of screenplays that you want to write. Now, not every script's going to get made. Right. So then for me, I thought about that and it's like, well then what's the value of it? So the value for me, I had to really kind of think about it. And the value for me is uh, because I take about six months, seven months a year sometimes to do one. And uh, in fact, hold on, let me show. Oh. Right, hold on, John. See all these? See all these things? Yep. <clears throat> these are all scripts I've written, right? Meaning... I, I, I have a lot of work to do to get them done and made, right? But I wanted 10 houses and I wanted 10 screenplays. That's what I wanted. And uh, so I set out for myself to find a way to support myself and then at the same time uh, be prolific or at least hit a number of sorts um, with the written work, right? So that was my game plan, however crazy, but I had a game plan. And think of yourself as uh, someone who wants a body of work. It's really important, I think, to have a body of work. And then so these, these screenplays are, some are historical, some are uh, bio, biographical. And it's great to have the capacity to walk in the room and be able to play a piano if it's sitting there. The same thing with a writer, as a writer. It's a great thing to be able to converse with different people about aspects of history that you've spent time on. You know, hey, you know, here's here's Mary after the crucifixion. Here's Vietnam. Here's Lady Godiva, mid medieval, uh, you know, England, Coventry. Here's you know whatever. So that for me, uh, I, I I look for a story where I'm going to get that part out of it, whether it gets made or not. And that's a selfish part that I take back for myself because I like um, it. It has to. Uh, you have to get something out of it if it doesn't get made right i love that you've increased your knowledge if you focus on any subject uh consistently when uh <clears throat> i wrote our feature film um the amount we learned on our subjects was unprecedented it's amazing uh, isn't it it's unbelievable so it is it's interesting. rewarding yeah and so that that's kind of uh when i dig into it when i when i okay that's that's one of the things that i one of the main things that i consider and then it's, you know, genre market. Can we sell it? Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, but, you know, projects can take, like I have this Vietnam piece called War Junkies and uh, I'd written like 24 drafts on it, right? We had uh, Mark Harris as a producer, right? Who did Crash, Gods and Monsters, big time guy, right? You know, he passed, he, he died of cancer. So then the whole project, okay, stuff like that, right? So things are going to happen like that, but now it's reactivated again. I got a call the other day where there's interest, financial interest and blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. I don't even, I haven't thought about that thing in five years, you know, but somebody has. It's a pleasure to speak with you. You know, I, um, <clears throat> I'm a film lover. I'm a film lover. I think to be passionate in writing films or to be passionate in writing poetry or to be passionate in writing songs, games, yeah. comic books, you know what you find? The people that are truly passionate and obsessed in what they do. They are lovers of the craft. Right. They are historians of the craft. They are, you know, true 
deep divers. It's not just a film. Who made it? Yeah. Who produced it? Who acted in it? Who is? You see, you want to understand the construct of it. I think right. that signal either goes off in your brain, or it doesn't. You're either passive audience or you're someone who has to get involved. I have to create. I'm not happy unless I create. Yeah. You can't put people like us in a shoebox. I didn't know how to build this little house. It took me four years. I did it myself. You're a doer. That's I mean, just, and what I mean is like uh, uh, for writers for to, to know that thing, I you know, it's okay to give yourself that determination. You don't have to be passive about it. You can politely just let people know this is what I'm doing. You know, because um, when you get quiet, at least for me, when I get quiet, when I'm focused, I I notice that that's when I begin to get all the phone calls from my friends and and family members and whatever. It's like, um, so this this house is about 40, 30 yards above the main house, right? And nobody can get me up here. Nobody can get me unless they walk this, you know, walk, but it doesn't doesn't happen. And so- um, Your retreat, it's your solitude. Yeah. And it's like, uh, because it takes me, it takes me like an hour or so to get in, to get the mind where I get into the good stuff. And if, it, if I'm interrupted, like an hour and five and I'm, I'm right there, I feel like choking someone. It's like, what are you doing? You know? I'm exactly the same. I actually spoke with someone uh, about this, um, a gentleman called Henry Priestman. Henry Priestman was in a band called The Christians in Liverpool. Okay. He performed, he's performed with Paul McCartney. He supported okay. the Sex Pistols and The Who. Serious guy. Really cool guy. And speaking about, you know, when us as writers, when we write, some can write with music on, they like that. Some need ultimate silence and focus. Right. And something I probably missed out when I spoke to him is others, we need to build up to it. You know, like, if I go on a walk, David, and I've got some music on, it's almost my warm-up to go bang and go for it. You know, creatively, I've got these sparks coming up. Yeah, yeah. And we're all we're very autistic. <laughs> Some of us, I probably am, most definitely. If I'm interrupted, there'd be hell to pay because I'm, <laughs> the moment. It's, I'm there. It's like I'm almost coming in. I can see the light of the tunnel. I've been talking about. You know, no one will ever That's get it. to create. Uh, my my roommates when I was in LA at the time. Uh... <laughs> They 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 knew that they would have the hell to pay if they came in my room when I was at my desk. It's just like you can't, you cannot. There's no way you can. You know, LA like being in Hollywood is like being in a a canoe and you have all this water around you in the ocean and you just need one cool soothing drink and you can't get it. You know, and it's by by its uh by its very presence it, it's frustrating because it's all around you. Yet to get there, to get inside, to get clicked in is the chore itself, which has, you know, carnage for decades, you know, in its wake. It's hard. It's hard. But you just, you, you, you embrace it, right? I mean, you embrace it. If we didn't have the and challenge. Find your techniques and get better. Always get better at what you're doing. Always get better at what you're doing. Always. If we didn't have the challenge, we wouldn't strive for greatness. We have to have the challenge. Yeah. yeah. We need the obstacle. We need the struggle. It's yeah. what the great things. I know. We're very similar. It's the same We're effort. Awesome. No, you're going to do it. Just don't don't be a lifeguard. I know. I've been there. Done that. I got fired. You threw your brick at the instructor. I got fired, David. You, you know, and uh, you know, when I began to get nervous is when he took his sandals off. And because <laughs> I was at eye level. And I see him take his sandals off and it's like, what are you doing? And he goes, in case I have to come and get you. It's like, Seriously. man, I'm a far away. I'm very far away from where <laughs> you're having written and directed. A movie. That was a moment where I felt very far away from <laughs> my achievement. You know, it's like. It is part of your fate, David. Push you to go and get 10 houses, write 10 scripts and be on the brink of creating a new narrative of how Martin Luther King. Had to rewrite it. Yeah. Had to rewrite my life. David, what a story. What a story. Thank you. Oh, sure. No, it's it's been a lot of fun. I've uh, probably the, forgotten a million other battles. You know, you just kind of move forward, right? I guess. But anyway, it's been a joy. I've had fun and I, I, I'm wishing you all the best in your endeavors. That's for sure.
thank you thank you ever so much and you know it, it's honestly been an honor to speak with you and to the audience that have watched it i hope you've enjoyed another fantastic episode stay great everybody and be seen